Sports Academy community. We are here with Matt Sprang and Seth Skorkowski. We're going to be talking about Traveler 2 and uh, other role-playing game related things, maybe a little bit of writing. We do have some uh, pre-conformed questions, but at the end of the show, we will leave about 30 to 40 minutes for our guests and, and customers and people that want to come in from the outside to ask questions of our guests. So without further ado, we will start with some introductions. So uh, let's start with you, Seth. Uh, uh, Matt has been here a few times, so we'll, we'll get, get him in here too. So... Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, well, I'm Seth Skorkowski. I am a fantasy author, and I uh, have a YouTube channel where I discuss role-playing games, uh, various philosophies or reviews of different systems, including Traveler, and um, basically an all-around just kind of a dork. <laughs> nice. And Matt, welcome. How, welcome back. So what, how are you doing today? Hi there, thank you very much for having me. Um, a bit earlier than normal, I've just got back uh, from the office where we were playing brand new game, uh, Shield Maidens. So I, I kind of uh, le left them to it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, good to have both of you here. And then we also have some of our um, Fantasy Grounds Academy um, faculty here and volunteers. And we also have our community here. We, we had about 30 people sign up here in Discord, and I'm sure there's some people out there in uh, Twitch and all the other social media streaming platforms. So um, I have some questions for you guys, and these are more based upon a little bit on Traveler, but also on writing and, and some of the processes that go into that. I wanted to uh, bring that to, to bear because we usually talk mostly just about the game itself, but... I think we'd be kind of remiss to uh, to not mention the process of, of how you get to this this point. So I'm not going to make this a big literacy uh, uh, campaign, but I do definitely want to hear from you guys, both of you, about your your creative writing process and and how that integrates with the role playing games. So that's uh, kind of what the uh, extent of the questions are. And then we also have some very pointed questions for you in regards to the. Uh, the rule set and the actual traveler too. Okay, so um, first question uh, for both of you: What is the most influential movie or book, or maybe some gaming content back in the day that inspired you to create content for Traveler Two or any games for that matter? Matt, you want this one? Uh, sure. <laughs> Um, well, that's a very, very big question. It, it really goes right across the board. Um, to give an example, uh, the initial concept for our big Pirates of Dranax campaign came from the old PC game Sid Meier's Pirates. Uh, Deep Knight Revelation um, owes a lot to um, films like Interstellar and uh, the Cosmos TV series. Uh, forthcoming Pioneer game draws a lot from the likes of Gravity, The Martian, 2001. It really can come from absolutely anywhere, really anywhere. Um, I mean, we might be playing, I don't know, a video game in the office or something, and just something will will trigger and think, you know, we we could have something similar to that in Traveller. So you, you take concepts and uh, look at them through the... Um, traveler tinted glasses to uh kind of figure out how they would look but uh no it, it can come from absolutely anywhere right and I seth absolutely agree um yeah, part of it's just it depends on whatever the hell i'm watching or, or, or reading at that time uh so it's kind of listing like well what has all inspired me it's like well tons of the expanse uh and of course uh, battlestar galactica uh, yeah, that was one of my uh, the reason I picked up Deep Night Revelation is because I'm a massive Battlestar Galactica fan. I was like, oh my God, we're on a giant ship and we're flying into nowhere. That sounds perfect. Uh, you, you can never discount Star Wars, uh, especially uh, for me, uh, the shows like the, the Mandalorian and, and Boba Fett, where it is the, uh, we're not paying attention to the war. We're just following people, usually seedy people. Um, and then, of course, you know, Alien or Firefly or, or all that. So I, you know, I'll, I'll rip off anything. Uh, one of the books that I've uh, 
enjoy the hell out of is Expeditionary Force, uh, which has some elements that I'm pretty sure were originally inspired by Traveler. Uh, and then, you know, if I'm getting inspired by that, it's just kind of the, the circle of, you know, inspiration life. So it's a little bit of everything. Um, I, I, I'm not really too picky in what I steal from. Right on. That's pretty much, uh, I think a lot of us have that same kind of, there, there, there was really any way to encapsulate one specific thing, but, uh, yeah, I agree. That's, uh, a multi um faceted question where you can have any sort of influence but i kind of wanted to just get an idea of where you guys are coming from and far as your influences and what uh what types of content you've consumed over the years so um for the um tools and techniques um that you use to develop your writing or things that help you um organize your process or or uh, what types of tools do you guys employ and when it comes right down to like writing and, and composition and, and uh, putting together your, your thoughts when you're creating content. Well, I think the, I think it's going to be fair to say that absolutely every writer is different in, um, in that degree. I mean, there's no uh, one way to uh, write an RPG book or even uh, write any given traveler book. Um, in terms of tools, it's uh, MS Word for me. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of process, well, you get the initial idea, you grab a, an A4 pad, start scribbling down ideas, and mm -hmm. from there, you start working out um, uh, an outline. You build the, um, uh, the chapter structure, figure out what's going to go into each chapter, and at some point, you just got to bite the bullet and uh, write the blinking thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, Just Seth? Same. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of software programs that, that authors uh, use to help organize themselves and all that. Um, man, I am, I am MS Word and Post-it Notes, um, freaking Post-it Note addict. And, uh, yep, the little yellow <laughs> legal pads. Uh, so, 3M. <laughs> I, uh, so my, my stuff is usually just uh, chaos. Uh, you know, the, the current one that I'm, uh, I've actually started kind of tooling with one the past few weeks of, of, of writing a scenario. And I think the first two pages are random ideas out of order. Some of them are questions like, you know, why, why don't they go through this door initially? I, I don't know, but that's something I need to consider. And then at the very bottom, I've got all my outline points like, you know, introduction themes characters you know all the all the stuff that would be chapters or, or sections in an adventure is is kind of like the bottom thing and then i will slowly start filtering through it and marking things out and moving stuff around but it's it, it's just chaos uh so I'm, I'm pretty sure that anyone reading my notes uh wouldn't understand a thing and i think every author has their own system of madness that they they use to organize because it's just it, it, some way we can get some ideas down that we can reference and you know kind of contemplate on the tree of woe. <laughs> yeah, I agree I with really you. Just want to work in tree of woe. Yeah, that's a, a definite uh, something that that I've employed. I've used uh, different things that that helped me like I've used uh, dragon dictation software for dialogue because I'm horrible at writing dialogue. It's, it's not easy to do You have to kind of have to sit there and talk to yourself to kind of make it sound right. So these are tools that I, I bring up because uh, we have people in our community that like to create content and I kind of want to give them that peace of mind that, you know, not everything's perfect. We all use different things. There's no one go-to tool. So that that's yeah. the, the reason for the question. Um, so what uh, within the Traveler universe, um, there seems to be a lot of flexibility in the type of content that one could create for that universe. So, uh, we're talking like the role playing game content or books or you know, things like that. So where would you start that process other than, you know, just just looking through the books? I mean, um, do you think your content would be driven by your own needs or maybe the wishes or requests of others, or do you just kind of organically do it, you know, randomly? 
<laughs> I think organically and randomly pretty much uh, covers it. I mean, when we when we start a new game or uh, start a, a new edition for Traveller, there are there going to be certain books that must be done. We need a high guard. We need a central supply to like form the uh, the, the pillars of the game. However, beyond that, um, what we have is a literal list of projects that we feel might be kind of cool to do. Um, and then they get assigned to writers uh, who get genuinely invested in them. Uh, I mean, just scanning that list at the moment, we have notes for books like, um, uh, really, we normally we just write down the uh, the titles, so we, we don't lock ourselves into uh, anything. We can let the, the writers fly with them. Uh, just looking at the list now, we've got titles like um, Core Expeditions, Rim Expeditions, Scout's Handbook, Ruins of the Ancients, The Empress Wave, Solo Traveller, Bounty Hunter, The Imperial Navy, and lots, lots more. None of those are assigned to writers yet, um, but all those are things that we want to add to Traveller over the next few years. Um, Writers also approach us and come up with their uh, own ideas for books. Uh, if they grab us, we commission them right away. Um, Spinwood Extents that we've just released is a good example of that. Uh, Gear approached us and said he'd already written half of it. Uh, he sent us a manuscript, it looked good, so we immediately commissioned the rest. That is quite rare, but um, you often get these... Uh, happy circumstances, um, but things can come out of the uh, the blue as well. Um, and Seth is a great example. He uh, did uh, a video on um, some classic adventures and saying, if I was going to run this, I would do uh, X, Y, Z. And we think, well, hark at him. I'll tell you what, mate, you write it the way you think it should be written and let's see let's see how good it is. And that's, that's how we've, um, uh, well, Death Station was the latest one Seth done. And uh, I think it's probably fair to say that's the best incarnation of the classic adventure yet. So yeah, it, it can come from out from absolutely anywhere. We do we do have a plan that runs uh, one to two years ahead, but beyond that, it's basically here's a bunch of cool ideas. Can we find a way to um, uh, actually get them into production? Okay. I, I noticed that you use the journals. Is that kind of one of your um, the premises for, for doing that sort of thing? Like, uh, I guess, capturing um, your fans and your uh, you know, people that support the, the products. Yeah, I mean, the, the journals are um, uh, a good, uh, a really good vehicle for all those uh, smaller ideas that uh, might um just hang around for uh, for years before they find uh, a bigger book to fit within because uh, in a journal it's literally a collection of articles so we can put just about anything in there um but it's also a good vehicle for um uh, writers that we haven't um worked with much or at all uh, in the past to um so like stick their flag into traveler show us what they can do and uh, maybe um, they start getting uh, bigger projects afterwards. I mean, that's exactly the way both Chris Griffin and um, uh, Gear started becoming um, uh, frontline writers for Traveller. That's great. Um, Seth, are you kind of in the same same vein as that? Like um, when you create content, are you doing it for um, your own sake, like your own games, or maybe someone's written to you and say, hey, Seth, can you create this? or Maybe you just do it randomly because you feel like it. <laughs> um, th well, for for me, there's always going, you know, uh, you know, and you know, my, my first uh, gig with Vagus is I had uh, uh, done the original Murder in Arcturus Station, and I I, I wrote uh, a, a prologue, and I wrote that for my group, and uh, I was basically started kind of taking my notes, sort of organizing it, but I hit up Matt going, hey. You guys should totally uh, do this. You know what it needs is a prologue, and I happen to have one. He's like, "Agreed. Uh, send me what you got." And uh, but at that point, I had already play tested it because I was I was using it for us. Um, the The only difference with me running it for my group that time was in the back of my head. I had the idea of like, I might I might try to see if I can get this published, 
Uh, but other than that, it was just just me running a, a game for my friends. Uh, all of all of the stuff so far that I've done role playing game wise has been uh, based off of my needs for for my game with my group. And I have uh, turned down some gigs where it was a commission because it, it it's very different if you're writing it with that kind of excitement of like, man, I can't wait till the guys see this or this is what really interests me right now uh, versus getting a commission. It, it's it's kind of like being assigned a, a, a homework task. And I don't. I, I'm not going to approach it with the same passion. I'm not going to to give it uh, the, the same sort of care that I would if it's something that just really grabs me and I have to do it for me. And maybe I could sell it too. And uh, some authors work great if you walk up and say, hey, uh, here's here's a rough concept of kind of what we're wanting. Can you do it? And they'll say yes. And then they come up with an idea. My, my very first uh, role-playing game, game writing job was for a Call of Cthulhu scenario, and, and I was asked to do it. And I, I said, hold on, initially. And I actually had to brainstorm ideas, and I came up with uh, this, a scenario outline, and I put it together as a pitch. And I sent that before I said yes. And most other authors would have said yes, and then come up with what they wanted to do, and then ended up you know, in a situation where their back's against the wall. And they end up kind of throwing something together because they have to. And I never want to be in that uh, job. I don't want I don't want gaming to ever become job like for me. Uh, I don't mind working. I don't mind having deadlines. I don't mind. I don't mind busting my butt. But I don't want that feeling like a job that I have to do this due to some obligation. And it is not some. It's not something I'm passionate about. So, uh, but you know, the big difference is is uh, Matt. Matt has a role playing game company. <laughs> I'm a dork with a camera, so <laughs> totally different worlds. <laughs> right, but uh, I mean, I, I I get that. That's uh, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there, there there's a lot of things we do in life that are you know by passion, and if you don't have that passion, it doesn't always come out so great. So that kind of segues into my next question. Uh, you guys pretty much answered that, but. Um, um, Matt, what about you? Other than financial um, stuff, is this kind of the same process for you, or or do you have some kind of uh, other motivation? Um, yeah, um, I mean, we're at Mongoose. We're in the happy position where we have never released a project um, purely for financial gain. Um, we've always taken the attitude that if we produce the games we ourselves want to play. There's going to be at least some people in the world who also like playing them. Uh, I mean, it's no accident that we do both um, Traveller and Paranoia. These are the games we were playing when we were teenagers. Um, sea of Thieves is another uh, case in point. We love the video game, so it was just natural that we would do an RPG as well. Um, we are lucky that our tastes do seem to resonate with enough people that we don't have to, um, uh, I don't know, become sort of, some sort of corporate monster. But um, uh, no, that's that's where we're coming from on that. Right. Uh, that, that's that's good to hear because I, I, I understand kind of where you guys are talking about it. Uh, things can look a little bit too corporatized and, and uh, generic and, and like you said, like kind of more financial um, financially uh, uh, motivated. Okay, so next question, um, a, a kind of a no-brainer, but have you guys met before, um, like at a convention, or maybe what 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 was your meeting like, uh, the two of you? I mean, was it that first module, or did you guys ever game together, or anything like that? No, uh, this is this is the first time we've ever actually ever spoken voice <laughs> to each other. Um, wow. Well, for for me, I I got uh, from a friend of mine uh, the the box red clearance edition of uh, mongoose, uh, and I did I did one of my videos, uh, you know, dressed in a in a red jumpsuit. Which I need to make another one because I've got I, I bought that stupid jumpsuit. And I need another excuse to wear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did a, I did a review video for uh, for paranoia, and 
man, it was like a year later or so. I, I guess uh, Matt hit me up. He's like, oh, my God, I just found this thing. Uh, could I interest you in some traveler? And that was I said, sure. I, I told him I wasn't going to uh, review it unless I played it. And I wasn't going to play it unless I thought it was going to be fun for my uh, group and I. But we just happened uh, by sheer chance. We had just wrapped or were wrapping a campaign like right then. And I just happened to really be wanting to play some sci fi. And you know, my, my group and I, we were kind of debating of like, what we might want to try and different stuff like that. And, uh, and he's, he said, look, I'm confident enough in our product that I think you'll, you'll like it. And, uh, so he sent me a stack of, uh, the, the core books that were out at the time. And he was right. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, we started playing traveler, but, but, uh, but Matt hit me up at just an absolute perfect moment where we were looking for a new game and I wanted sci-fi. And he said, yeah, I'm confident enough in our products that I think you'll you'll dig it and you'll play it and you'll you'll want to do this. And it was just perfect. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I mean, I, I did stumble across um, Seth's review of Paranoia. Um, I was really impressed with the um, the production quality um, uh, of his video. He also said some quite nice things about Paranoia. Um, so yeah, I offered uh, to send him some Traveller. He uh, he said um, he had only review them if he got got into them if he thought they were um, uh, you know worthy. Don't worry about that. I said I'm pretty confident that um, if you like Paranoia, you'll like uh, Traveller. So uh, I sent him a, a pretty big box of stuff and um, just said, have at it. Yeah, it was that's great. A, a perfect, absolute perfect timing on his part. Had it been a, three months, six months earlier or a few months later, I'd have been like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it eventually. And um, yeah, God knows when um, I would have been able to do it. Uh, one of one of my big policies is uh, I don't I don't review something unless we play it, um, and that's you know I I've, I have seen reviews where it was very obvious to me the person reviewing it hadn't played it, and whether whether it was a glowing review or a scathing review, and it it annoys me to to no end uh, that they don't have any first hand experience with it, so. Uh, very early on, I decided that yeah, I want to at least have either played it or run it, and I, it usually is running it for me. And but I'm not going to run it for my friends unless I think it's something that looks like it's going to be fun and it's something that fits with us. And you know, I'm not going to commit them to all the time and effort to learn and play a game. Unless I think, uh, guys, we're going to have a freaking blast. And I'm not going to learn a whole new game unless I think this is going to be worth our time, as in we're going to have a, a lot of fun with it. So, you know, kind of going with the, the financial gain, uh, man, I am I get hit up constantly to to review games that do not interest me or aren't a good match for us or yeah, you know, we're currently in the middle of a great campaign. I'm not going to quit this game that I'm playing with my friends just to uh, get some playtime in on something so I can review it because I, 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 a publisher wants it or they're they're willing to pay for it or anything. So it's just Matt hit just absolute flawless timing. <laughs> it's a great product. I fell in love with it immediately. It's great. Uh, uh, kudos to both of you just sticking to your guns and and uh, I wouldn't say selling out, but that's kind of what you're saying is you're not selling out. You're you're uh, kind of feeding off passion and and um, what you know and not just doing it. So that's that's great. Um, so kind of related. Um, what do you guys think your ratio is for business versus pleasure when it comes to the hobby? So. Maybe it started off as just a hobby and it became business, or maybe it was business and now you're kind of wanting to play more. I mean, what's that like for you now versus before? Uh, well, for us, it's um, it's ninety eight percent pleasure. I mean, there's always things you don't like doing in business, such as um, I don't know, such as doing the accounts or getting the office roof repaired or whatever. 
Um, but we get to work on these games all day, every day. It's a full-time job, and there's you can't think of um, uh, anything better, really. Um, I and mean, we have this uh, rule in the office that when we're looking at um, uh, a new project, I mean, it could be... Um, traveler supplement but um if we're looking for a looking at doing a brand new game that uh, we could we've got um, a big long list of uh, games that um we we could be doing um but we don't take we don't put any of those into production unless there's at least one person in the office who is deeply passionate about the project um that doesn't have to be me as long as there's at least one champion for it uh, then it becomes um, it becomes viable for us. Um, if there's no one um, acting as its champion, then that game doesn't get made. Um, as for it being a choice between labor or love or a business, you, you can do both. Um, it doesn't have to be a slog just because um, it's the uh, just because it's your job every day. Uh, for example, every Every Friday afternoon, we down tools and we um, uh, we play games. It's a it's a company rule. If we're going to produce the games, we're going to be playing the games as well. As I said earlier, we I've just come back from a play test of the new Shield Maidens game. Next week, we're going to be going back to our Pirates of uh, Dranax campaign. Um, so yeah, it's if we didn't enjoy it, we'd be we wouldn't be doing this. That's great. Uh, Seth, kind of the same thing, or what? what's your uh, business-to-pleasure ratio? Um, after I, I started doing the channel, uh, there was definitely a business side, you know, just a facet to it that had never been there, but it's it's primarily pleasure. I, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to put as much time in it if there wasn't the business side. Uh, but at the same time, I am, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I can, I can do my hobbies as, you know, as, as, as a business now it's freaking fantastic. But so I, I do have to keep that in mind, but it is primarily pleasure. Uh, just gross majority is, is pleasure. Uh, if, uh, if it was purely business minded uh i i wouldn't be able to do what i do the way i do it uh, because every decision would would have to uh, come up against the the business side and uh, you know in the, in, the, in the tabletop industry uh that would be you know a, a lot more sponsored content uh, i i would be playing uh or reviewing the the hottest most popular game the week it comes out um and instead of uh I, i'd be doing a video of like hey everybody we're going to talk about a, an adventure that's been out of print for 40 years i mean that's not if i was motivated by business i wouldn't be doing that uh so but there is still the the business mind of uh i do have to have a quality i do have to keep a regular schedule i do have to uh consider things with how I approach it that is, you know, from a business mind, but it's mostly pleasure. That's great. Okay. Um, I'm asking a question on behalf of people that may want to get into the, the hobby, uh, especially in writing and, and creating role-playing games and, and developing content. Um, do either of you have any advice on which type of content does well traditionally for you i mean is it stories is it adventures supplements uh you know what sort of content or steps or any sort of uh things that you guys know of uh of, you know just from being in the industry for a while well i think um say so if you if you wanted to break into the industry one proven route is starting your own youtube channel reviewing all the traveler books and then telling us how you uh <laughs> improve them and just wait for us to, to contact you um the way we what we normally say is start off with uh jtas articles because you can uh 
you can do it on one one page in Word, uh, and that can be an article. So um, it allows you to concentrate on, allows you to focus on a, a very small project, um, but you'll learn a lot doing it. And uh, we can have larger um, JTAS articles where you can uh, go up to 12 or 18 pages in Word uh, maximum. But once you've demonstrated the um, your understanding of Traveller and your ability to write for it, uh, write for it. Um, chances are we're going to approach you at some point and say, "Hey, would you like to do um, one of the uh, a new thirty-two page adventure?" And if you pull that off, um, we're going to um, very likely offer you um, one of the hardbacks at uh, some point in time. Um, I mean, as I say, this is the exact route that uh, Chris Griffin and uh, Gear took. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the YouTube, uh, the path seems to, seems to work as well. Okay. Um, uh, Seth, you got any comments on that? No, I, uh, yeah, I, I look at stuff like, you know, JTAS is the same as when I was, you know, trying to break into just writing fiction. It's, it's, it's like short stories, uh, versus novels. And a lot of times if you're trying to. Uh, pitch novel or get an agent or, or get a publisher for a larger work, they want to see the, you know, if you've done short story sales and that sort of thing, because what that says is one, you, you write at a quality that somebody would be willing to pay for uh, Two, that you're, you're willing to work with an editor. And because that also says quite a bit, is this somebody who uh, is willing to make, changes to their things based off of an editor's opinion or, or are you going to fight tooth and nail uh, for absolutely every little thing uh, based off of, you know, whatever the, the creator's vision is. And so I, I think things like doing a, a JTAS article is a spectacular way of at least saying, look, I've, I've, I've taken those initial steps. You know, you can, you can see my, my work, you know, I, I know how to form a sentence. And, but also in today's age and age, we've got things like the, uh, just self-publishing and, and, and all of that with, uh, with those programs, it's spectacular. So, uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, you don't have to make uh, a YouTube channel and <laughs> just hit them up. Uh, but because a lot of times I was like, well, how, how did you get this job? I was like, you can't follow my path. If you do, it's it's a terrible path. Uh, if your goal is to to, to write a, an adventure, uh, it's like, well, you first you have to sell some books, and then you make a YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> but things where you can hit it up for uh, the JTS articles or just publish a scenario with the Journal Traveler's Aid Society, you know, uh, get that sort of writing street cred and build from there. <laughs> so the next question is going to be probably a little different for, but for both of you, but um, so what is your toughest or most demanding content related process in, in regards to your day-to-day -day work? So um, uh, both of you probably, yeah. Are you able to hear me? Yep, you, you want to go, Seth? I think Seth may be frozen. Yep, ah. it sounds like it. <laughs> Matt, go, you're up. Go ahead, Matt. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I, I do have a good example, actually. It's um, not um, traveler related this time. Yeah. Um, but um, toughest, uh, lately it's been our Shield Maidens game. Um, we had a solid concept uh, down in writing, uh, basically cyberpunk stroke Viking shield maidens fighting against gods and a fascist empire, which is a good enough idea. But we um, actually finding the settings voice in terms of art was a real trial. We had lots of ideas, but nothing quite clicked. Um, we got the look of the setting um, uh, down pretty quickly, um, and we've we've released some um, previews of the concept art of there, but we really couldn't um, get in our heads what the shield maidens themselves should look like, and we went through so many iterations, um, uh, and just uh, just a few weeks ago, everything 
came together and started clicking. Um, and I, I think we're pretty much there now, so we can finally get on with the uh, the rest of the artwork. But uh, no, it was just finding that um, central core that got everything to click. And for the longest time, we just couldn't find it. Hmm. That That is interesting. I've had conundrums like that where just a title can hold up the whole whole process. Uh, what about you, Seth? Are you back with us? Yeah, evidently. I, I, I gave the most brilliant uh, answer to your last question. Nobody on earth heard it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least that's my story. Uh, so we're, we're talking about just, just challenging and, and yes. tough. Yes. Well, <laughs> The, the the most demanding uh, stuff for me is mostly just trying to I don't know, keep I, I try to diversify my stuff that that I do. So I'm, uh, with the channel, I'm trying to keep at least one video out every every two weeks. I had done it as as one week, and then I started suffering a just burnout of you know the dishes weren't getting done, and it was becoming just uh, it was becoming too job like for me. Um, so kind of my, my demand of, I want to, I don't like putting together uh, the same thing back to back. So there is kind of a constant looking out for the next thing to do. That isn't what I did before, or at least, you know, trying to at least keep a, a, a the diversity. Uh, so if, you know, one week I want to do a gaming review over this system, I want to talk about a different system. Or I want to talk about general philosophy, the, the next video. Uh, so there is kind of a constant changing gears. Uh, whenever I do post something, uh, I usually have about two days where I just relax and, and let out a breath. And then I'm immediately thinking about the, the next thing I'm going to start put, trying to put together. Uh, so that, that to me is my biggest challenge of, uh, there's, there's kind of a constant go, go, go. Uh, but even if I do come up with a great idea from one video of like, oh, that'll work great on the next one. If it's too similar to what I did as far as the the theme, you know, I've got my horribly messy files of, of future ideas that is like I'll get to that eventually. Um, sometimes they'll be on that list for years before I get around to it. But that's that's for me. That's it. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, what about your most uh, rewarding experiences for 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 both of you or either? So. There, is there a moment that you said, "Hey, this is great," or "This is uh, this is how life should be"? You know, one of those rewarding moments that you won't forget, uh, related to the industry, of course. Yeah, um, I, I, I do have one that uh, comes to mind. Um, over the past of the past few years, it's been um, rewarding staff. Uh, the Mongoose staff for their efforts. Uh, I mean, they get to mess around with games they enjoy all day. Um, and being able to make sure that they get paid properly, have a great environment to work in, get regular bonuses, is really the the, the cherry on top of that. Um, there's been a, a few store, industry stories banging around over the past few months that um, suggest there's an attitude that working in the tabletop games industry means that you'll be forever on the breadline. Um, but if you can make some smart decisions at the top and not be greedy about things, it really doesn't have to be that way. Um, it's kind of satisfying to to go against that grain. Um, I mean, to give to give one example, we've got um, a big and very long term project that we're working on at the moment to eventually turn Mongoose into um, an employee-owned company. Now, that's some years away from being done, um, but we're paving the route at the moment. Uh, and it really does give everyone a greater sense of literal ownership and agency in everything they do. It's, from the start, I wanted Mongoose to be a place where people aren't dreading coming into the office on a Monday morning, um, but they're they're able to uh, turn up, do the things they need to do in a way they want to do them, and have, uh, as I say, enough agency to to decide how to structure both their their working day and also the projects they're they're working on. 
So at the moment, that's that's where I'm probably getting the most satisfaction at the moment. That's good to hear. That's uh, that'll help promote longevity and uh, it keeps uh, attrition down. So that that's a good uh, good business strategy. And, and you know, we have a volunteer community here, and I kind of feel the same way. Like if if I go away, I don't necessarily want this to go away. I just want I want it to keep going um, without me. So uh, I know exactly I, what you mean. <laughs> yep. So I, I don't want the burden of saying, okay, you know, Matt's gone, no more traveler. You know what I mean? Like, or no more mongoose. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, how about you, Seth? For me, the most rewarding has, has, has been getting to just communicate, talk to a lot of my heroes, um, you know, in the, in the in the dark days before the interweb, uh, there were a lot of the people who created a lot of the stuff that, that I enjoyed uh, were kind of like these names. They're kind of like these these mythological figures to me. And um, you know, now I've, I've I had this situation where I sit around and just talk with them. Uh, you know, just share a meal or, or just just have a conversation about. That it it's that to me has been uh, kind of my, my my big reward of uh, just getting to to hang out with uh, a lot of uh, the people that I've I've looked up to and have made these these massive influences on my life. Uh, one of the things which always kind of strikes me as odd when I've gone to different gaming conventions or whatnot is if you you'll you'll see someone who had a bit part in a, in a sci-fi show years ago. And, you know, those, those actors may have influenced the, the people there, but the people that have influenced my life the most were the ones like, you know, uh, Mike Pondsmith from, from cyberpunk. Yeah. I have literally hundreds upon hundreds of hours of completely unique memories based yep. off of that. Uh, well, the entirety of Star Wars is what, like 15 hours. Uh, but so, so these people have massive influences on my life. So getting to uh, chat with them and uh, as, as peers has been amazing. That is great. Uh, it's very similar here. Um, you know, we get to interact with people all over the world. Um, also get to talk to people such as yourselves. And we also get to, um, share you know knowledge we have very talented people that come through here we've got writers programmers people that are into the industry but also their skill sets and their passions lend itself to the, the to the hobby so that's one of the reasons we do this is we want to connect everyone together and and kind of get everyone uh i wouldn't say on the same page but at least on the same uh mindset for for sharing their their hobby so um what uh, current projects or something that you're excited about right now that you can reveal, uh, you know, non-NDA stuff, or maybe it is, I don't know, but uh, anything you guys got going, cooking? Yeah, to be honest, we don't really do the NDA thing. Um, I mean, occasionally if we get a license from uh, an outside uh, party, there may be NDAs involved, but other than that, we're a pretty open book, actually. Um, I'd say we, we just need somebody to ask ask a question about what we're working on. We'll, we'll tell you. <laughs> um, I mean, right now, this week, um, I've been working with um, working a lot with Cassie on our new Shield Maidens game. Um, I've been helping Bella heard the um, uh, the current crop of JTAS articles uh, along, which uh, Katrina is. Uh, putting, uh, laying out into uh, the new volumes. Sandrine's currently working on deck plans for Ships of the Frontier, the uh, latest title with 2300. And I'm currently waiting for manuscripts for High Guard Update 2022, uh, Bayern, Paranoia Perfect Edition, and Tools for Frontier Living. So, um, yeah, quite busy at the moment. <laughs> How about you, Seth? You writing anything? Um, new or interesting you can reveal um not really uh as far as uh 
you know, official industry publisher things. I have to wait till they announce. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's yep. it's just kind of that that holding pattern of yep. like, oh my God, talk about this, and I can't. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think that the, the closest one that I have currently is uh, so because they they have announced it. Uh, there is a a dice set that I'm doing with uh, Q Workshop. Um, oh yeah, they they hit me up. I guess about this time last year, uh, maybe about ten months ago, where uh, they wanted to do what I consider like you know, my dice set. Uh, so then we spent months of me kind of uh, helping design these. Mm -hmm. So with with my preferences and. Uh, you know, such as I don't like symbols instead of numbers or, you know, what, what dice would I want extras of? What colors do I like? You know, uh, kind of my taste. And we, we have the, the, the uh, concepts of them. I can't share them. So uh, right now I actually have to, like, you know, listening, they're, they're overnighting me the, um, uh, the sample ones that they've made to, mm -hmm. to get my approval. Uh, so they, they send them over from from Poland, uh, but I can't share these. Right, I, I have to wait until they share them, or they give me the "you have permission to to share." Right. This. Uh, so it, it's kind of a, a a lot of holding for me. So out of, out of any of the stuff I got brewing, I can't talk about it. Other than I got stuff brewing. <laughs> Right on. I think uh, having those dice in your hand, though, um, feeling how they roll, how they're weighted, um, you know, if they're straight edge, rounded edge, um, you know, what it looks like in the light, it, that's actually important for, for the product, I think. And the uh, the fact that you have a dice set that's kind of based on your personality or on yourself is, I would say that's a milestone. Um, if you have your own freaking dice set, I, I have to say that that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I saw yeah, that, by the way. <laughs> there, 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 there have had to be a, a, a few small concessions, um, mostly due to uh, marketability, mm -hmm. uh, such as no, no game that I play uses a D twelve, and I was, I was informed we have to have a D twelve. Oh, like, like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so, <laughs> That's not too uh, bad. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, but, but, but little things like that where they're like. Um, uh, like, 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 calm down, Skippy. And, uh, so that's, <laughs> but, but nothing, no, no bad concessions, but there were like, we had to do a T12. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it's good that they didn't force, uh, uh, gambling six sided dice on you with the pips. Oh, we have to have that instead of numbers. <laughs> well, I actually, <laughs> yeah, um, I can, you know, probably <laughs> let this one out. Uh, there, there are, pips on one of the dice nice. and that was my knife fight for um because i didn't want that die to be confused with a different die with the same number of faces uh so i demanded that that one have pips that way people can tell which one is that die very that cool probably it sounds more confusing <laughs> no i i think that. it's a great thing <laughs> um so <laughs> uh but my big one was symbols um when it, when it comes to die uh you know, I, I've never used a set of die. I've always got like like five million die behind my screen because mm -hmm. I'm running. And uh, so if it comes up with a symbol, I'm always like, is that the high die? Is that the low die? I don't know. Uh, so I always want clear to read and, and you, know, you know what number it is. Uh, so the only exception to that is if the, the game itself requires symbols. But anyways, we can talk about that once I can actually talk about what they look like. Nice. Uh, I imagine you'll do a little short video if, if, if you no, know, in the future. I'm trying to figure out if I, like, I've done the dice review gag one twice. I don't want to necessarily do that. So I'm thinking like maybe sham. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, infomercial. Or, <laughs> so it, it, I'll figure it out. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. So um, I want to go back to traveler. And then after, um, you know, after that, we'll, we'll start pulling in some questions from the outside. Uh, Greg, do you have uh, some of the questions that our faculty had handy? I know I posted them. I in do. Okay. Yeah, I got what Russ has got in here. Okay, um, good. He's got quite a bit for, for Seth. Uh, do we want to just do one or two? Yeah, so I'm going to ask this last question, uh, which is related anyway. So um, and that way we can kind of bounce back and forth. And then if there's any questions from the uh, 
you know, in the chat or anything, kind of mix those in. Cause I don't want it to just be, you know, conversation with just one person all the time. So yeah, I'll put good. the call out on Twitch for more Q and a questions too. All right then. So um, in character creation with traveler two, I'm, I mean, I'm not a big traveler two player, but I'm, I'm getting more and more interested in it as, especially doing these shows and, and these uh, Q and a and Greg and uh, Russ are actually our, our rule set. Um, reps for that but um, for myself I thought that the character creation process was was really fun and interesting uh, it's a lot more um, I mean I could spend two hours just doing that you know it's a lot of fun the potential outcomes uh, do um, give me a little suspense and uh, sometimes some of the roles you make can really uh, change the way that you might um, want to play that character or you might even roll something different but uh, so uh, you think, um, is there a process like this? I'm kind of asking from a naive standpoint. I don't know a lot about the rule set, but is there a process that's equally fun, like towards ships and NPCs, like die rolls and, and uh, generating these types of similar outcomes like you get with the characters? I think that um, could be fun. I'm not sure it's practical if you need more than one NPC created and game night is looming. Right. Um, however, doing that sort of creation for derelict ships is a really interesting idea. Um, perhaps uh, something for JTAS if someone wants to write that up. I was just thinking that sounds like a perfect JTAS article. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so for as much fun, no, no, because the character <laughs> creation system is badass. Uh, the when when Matt sent me these books and, and I started reading character creation, that was the like, holy crap, guys, you have got to check this out. This is insanely cool. Uh, but for for NPCs, there actually is a, a couple much simpler because you know you, you don't have like three hours for right. for every NPC. Uh, but when we're doing like contacts and allies and that sort of deal, uh, that has has led to some really fun twists on it. I remember one character, uh, their ally had them confused with someone else. I, I think so. Like they kind of kind of rolled on, the, on this little chart. It's like okay, so you've got this great contact. The and it ends up the the whole reason this guy's your contact is he thinks you're somebody else, and. <laughs> it, it, it it led to some some fun things when we were doing uh, Marduk because uh, they, they they went to Marduk and it was like you know you got this job because this guy is absolutely convinced you're this other person uh, <laughs> but they're they're a great contact yeah just weird little twists on on all sorts of stuff I I love all that about it <laughs> um, I have on a major NPC done the the character creation process mostly that was me just blowing some time uh, because <laughs> it's it's kind of in depth but uh, I don't think there's anything you could do it if, if you're saying is as much fun as character creation not not as <laughs> <laughs> okay fair enough um, so some virtual tabletops have some unique features and and one I can speak on is uh, Fantasy Grounds uh, it has a a tool or utility built into it. It's it's uh, was created by uh, you know by a third party guy and, and augmented to the current system. But basically, you can take a bunch of tables and roll on other tables, and it can get very complex. So you can generate stories and and such. And I thought that the character creation process could almost be automated. But the problem I have with that is it kind of takes away the fun. So. You know, you would click on one button and it would just basically go through all the tables and generate a, an output. But I thought maybe on NPCs and derelict ships that would be better because um, I don't want to rob that process from the players because that's part of the fun is, you know, rolling different dice. If you did it one click, that kind of takes away the, the the suspense and such. But um, I think um, tables definitely have a place in, in – um, in space because there's so many variables and things that that would occur and that's kind of why i brought this question up because i thought you know that that rule set is so open to just about anything and, and having more tables and stuff is just you know one of those things i think that game masters and players will enjoy um so i guess it's a suggestion to anyone creating content or to you guys um is to have something like that uh uh, and that's just, you know, kind of spitball in there. But uh, that was my own personal 
question about the rule set and such. So I will say with tables, though, mm-hmm. uh, as a, you know, as a GM or when you're writing adventures, uh, mo- I get probably more inspiration from reading the table mm-hmm. than rolling on the table. Right. Uh, because, you know, you're, you're there like I was in different combinations. You're like, oh, my God, this would be so cool if uh, or, you know, sometimes like just that that one option out of, out of that wall of options kind of jumps out at you and you're like oh yeah this is great uh <laughs> so um where if, if you just go in you click a button it gives you the results that would not do it for me uh, right the, the the same way as as reading it now some of the the processes i would love to automate um or at least kind of help out with that and that's not necessarily doing a random ship but ship creation, I just did a, a, a kind of a, a long how-to on it. There's a, there's a lot of parts that would be great to uh, handle the math for you, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't want it to come up with what I'm putting on my ship. I just want it to be able to handle the paperwork part of it because, man, my I hate the paperwork part of it. <laughs> uh, I hear you. So, yeah, I, I kind of felt the same way. I didn't want to steal that from you know, from the players and the GMs, but I thought that, you know, with, with modern technology, we got to use it somehow. And I, that, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so let's uh, take a quick breather here. Um, how's everyone doing? Um, you guys okay on time and uh, bathroom breaks or anything like that? Yep, all good. Okay. So we're at the top of the hour. Uh, Greg's got some questions that are really directly about uh you know, traveler and stuff for Seth and, and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, Greg, you want to uh, go ahead and ask some of that? Yeah. So we got some of, uh, you know, my co-conspirator here at the Fantasy Grounds Academy for the Traveler Month, uh, Russ. He's got a bunch of questions. I won't go through him his in order. I'll, I'll alternate between his and what we're getting in, in Discord and in Twitch. We need a um, tape. So, I'll, so I'll lead with him, and then we get, I got a question from Nicole, and I got a question from Rusty, and... If you guys got other questions, start sending them now in Twitch and in Discord. But starting with what Russ had posted previously, first one's for Seth. Um, are you going to include Jack, the NPC, in future scenarios? It depends uh, on the scenario. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it, uh, the, yeah I, I, my very first one, there is a Jack, the NPC character in it. Uh, that was the one they did with Call of Cthulhu. But as, as far as... I'm not going to shoehorn him into a scenario unless unless he fits. But you have to remember, Jack is kind of the embodiment of all NPCs, so he's always there. Watch him. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> the next is going to be for Matt. Uh, with errant lightning and the introduction of Gamma Research Station and the Psionic Atom community, what is next for the core sector adventures? Yeah. Um... Uh, I mean, we do have uh, something of a problem. We've got for um, uh, for the Trojan Reach, we've got seven adventures. We're painfully aware we've at the moment only got two for the marches um, and uh, the Great Rithney is expanding. Uh, we we made sure we had three adventures straight off for uh, for the core um, and we we will be looking for more. But the next big thing for that area of space is going to be um, the Singularity campaign um, written by uh, Chris Griffin. He's just about to start work on it. Uh, It looks like it's going to be a three-volume mega (laughs) epic campaign along the lines of uh, Pirates of Drenax or Deep Knight Revelation. Um, the basic premise is that um, someone within the core has created um, uh, an AI. It has, uh, they've decided to try and kill it. So it's trying to escape. Um, and the campaign will be um, the players uh, taking um, basically parts of its consciousness that it's broken off. And they're trying to find a route out of the out of the uh, Imperium. Um, uh, so there will uh, there'll be adventures where they run into a dead end, and uh, those bits of consciousness get uh, killed off or have to retreat. There'll be uh, others where they have to accomplish 
something on one side of the Imperium, so um, uh, another fraction of consciousness on the other side can um, uh, achieve its goals. Um, it's going to be um, a fair study into the uh, the nature of AI, but um, uh, as always through the through the traveler lens. Um, so yeah, that's that's going to be our a big epic campaign for this year, and you'll probably see it um, uh, towards the bottom end of 2022. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, awesome, yeah. All right, so coming off awesome. of uh, Russ, we're going to go to some of the questions we're getting. Uh, actually, the first one, I missed it, was from Kent. Kent, if uh, you, you want to ask it, you're welcome to go open mic. Yeah. You caught me a bit on the hop there with all the mute buttons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks again, uh, and, and thanks uh, Matt and Seth. It's really great um, you putting in the time like this. It's really great. One of the, one of the questions I had was uh, just maintaining that sense of heroic adventure in Traveller. Uh, one of the observations in games I play, just say as a comparison with D and D, in D and D, you you tend to be able to let the heroic adventure rule because like obviously it's fantasy it's made up whereas sometimes in traveler games maybe it's just the people that, that, that i play with there tends to be a bit of a focus more on the science and you know when we at the right lagrange point or or whatever so i guess my question is how do you try to maintain that sense of heroic adventure what have you got suggestions for that even, even though maybe the science may be a little less precise sometimes in the games this is something we've looked at a lot. Um, I mean, if you're designing stuff for Traveller, at some point it's you're going to start thinking along the lines of um, what would happen if, um, I don't know, we suddenly got the Star Wars license and for some reason we decided a Traveller was a system do it. How would we portray something like Star Wars using the Traveller system? Um, I mean, we have also uh, had a look at doing some sort of um, superhero setting because um, we do think that um, uh, if you watch um, the Marvel films, especially uh, when they get to their big uh, multi-hero fight scenes, the heroes are um, building their special abilities and attacks off one another. So. Um, uh, I don't know, Thor drops his hammer, sends a lightning bolt off, bounces it off uh, Captain America's shield and increases its effect. Um, to me, that's got Traveller Task Chain written all over it. So we do think about things like that. Um, but if you were to keep, if you wanted to raise that kind of power level and have um, superheroes or people with extraordinary abilities, um, it does occur to me that uh, if you want to keep the same spread of basic characteristics, um, you have to make normal people, um, you have to limit their characteristics. So uh, five or six becomes the high end for a, a normal person's strength or dexterity or what have you, uh, whereas the players can go up to the uh, to the normal 15. So no, there, there are um, lots of different ways of doing it. Um, uh, I mean, you could have some sort of, it's a lazy way of doing it, but you could have some sort of hero point um, system where people get to re-roll or um, add big bonuses or do over certain uh, things. A traveler can do it. We just haven't done it yet, <laughs> if, that, if that makes sense. For uh, my impression of Traveler is it is, there is so much to it. Uh, I mean, we've got, you know, all the stuff on trade, we've got all the, 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 the different rules that do break into the science and you can, you can deep dive into those aspects if you want, but all of it's just a toolbox. And one of the, the best pieces of advice I had got from a, a fan when I, had, I first started talking about uh, that we were playing Traveler was decide what it is you want your game to be. And just stick to that because you can't do all of it. You can't do the entire travel universe. It's just too big. Uh, if you want to do a, a, a mercenary campaign, do a mercenary campaign. Don't even pay attention to trade rules. Uh, if you if you want to do just a pure smuggler campaign and you don't care at all about 
the the lore of the world, that's fine. If you want humans only, cool. Um, so if if somebody wants to like kind of downplay the science part of it and and really just get to the adventure, you know, where uh, where like in Star Wars, you never really know how long they're in jump space or in the in hyperspace uh, they call it. Uh, because it, it doesn't matter. You know, we're about saving the princess and blowing up the big, you know, Death Star or what, whatever it is. If if that's what you want, you can focus on that. Just because those things are presented in the the game system as a tool you can use, doesn't mean you have to. Uh, I, however, think I like them being there, and I think the show is being acknowledged as they're there because that's how players can get creative. Uh, and, and and be able to kind of kind of squeeze that pain out of it if they know all that stuff is there and those tools are available to them. Um, but unlike D and D, you're kind of expected you will play a hero. With Traveler, here's a universe, and you do whatever it is type of game or you know play in it however you think would be fun. Um, and I think that's one of the big fundamental differences between the Traveler and, and other games, where it is, here's a little bit of everything. You decide what type of game you want in that and just use that part. So that's kind of how I'd answer that is do it. As far as mechanics, we totally ripped off the inspiration mechanic from uh, D&D 5e, which I think ripped it off from another game that ripped it off from another game before where... Somebody impresses me, I give them a little token and they get a free boon whenever they want it. So you can you can throw in those types of mechanics if you want. They're fun. Uh, but if if you don't want to focus on the science, then don't. Thanks, guys. Yeah, great. Uh, next up is a question from Nicole. Nicole, did you want to ask that or otherwise I'll, I'll vocalize it for you? Okay, so uh, Nicole's question is: it, Is it possible to create non-RPG products for Mongoose Traveler, like cards or something? And then she followed up with an example, maybe like drawing coins. Ah, uh, yeah, the drawing coins. So uh, there's um, uh, two people in our office that um, uh, backed uh, backed the Kickstarter for those. Um, yeah, the quick answer is yes, um, and we have started experimenting. Um, we've got a small but growing line of Traveller Fiction. Um, last year we did a CD soundtrack for Pirates, Dranax, uh, Pirates of Dranax, and uh, just before Christmas we did a uh, bona fide music video um, with an original song for Traveller. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a question of... Um, time really um it always comes down to uh do you want us to do something um funky like that uh something outside the norm or do you want us to do a uh, high guard 2022 or the new singularity campaign um and you might make a decision one month but for later this year the question is going to be the same thing but with different um uh, different project titles we do try and push the boat out a little on um, the Kickstarters. Uh, and we started um, having options for um, uh, bits and pieces for Traveller that go beyond um, uh, the project that um, uh, we're, we're working on at the time. Um, for example, for Deep Night Revelation, we had a, a cloth uh, mission patch um that we've done um uh, what's it a vehicle recognition guide for um uh for the mercenary campaign so yeah we do look for things like that and if anybody ever has any suggestions uh please fire them uh, our way with um uh, we're always looking for good ideas hey matt I, I think i finally got the the um muting to, to unmute um <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking more of uh, third-party products being able to license the the mongoose version of Traveler for things like board games that you know, or you know, there, there's I, I can think of two dozen products off the top of my head, Traveler-based, but some would require actually accessing the rules 
that Mongoose has put together? If you've got uh, two dozen ideas, select the best of them and send us a proposal. Seriously. Okay, I'll do that. Thanks. Cool. And and uh, just to let you know, those drawing coins are on the boat. So, <laughs> so it's, it's perfect timing. Um, in the office, uh, Katrina is playing a drawing character um, in our Drenax campaign, so that they're going to get actual use. <laughs> All right. Cool. Great, thanks, Nicole. Next up is Rusty. Uh, yeah, Seth, uh, as an actual uh, celebrity among the uh, Traveler fans, I, I think I can confidently speak for most of us here uh, when we when I say we would uh, really love to see you in action. Have you ever thought of streaming any of your sessions? No. Um, yeah, but so for my my players and I, uh, game days are our day to not have a care in the world and be just stupid dorks and and not worry about anything else but just us hanging out as a bunch of friends. Because uh, most of my group, uh, we've played together for you know decades, so we're very old and close friends, and that's just. That's just our time. And I think having a camera in the room would be intrusive. So none of uh, none of my players are pretty unanimous. And, uh, you know, they, they they love me telling stories about our games, but they never want our games to be out there. So those are just those are for us. Uh, that's that's disappointing, but cool. Understandable. Okay, hey, Rusty, thank you. Uh, next one, we're going to go to Toil. Uh, this one's for Seth. He, he's wondering what games you're playing right now. I mean, not um, maybe just this, this very second, but <laughs> this spring. Uh, let's see. Right now, uh, I, uh, we're, we dusted off our old Pulp Cthulhu campaign. Uh, I've got a bit of side game occult going on. And we're, I've got... I'm actually getting to play in a uh, game of Cyberpunk Red at the moment, whenever they can fit that one in. It's very sporadic. So those are the three games I'm playing in currently. Cool. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go back up because Russ had quite a bit, and then I'll go back down to the bottom. So coming back to your uh, Russ question, um, this one is for Seth. Have you had any thoughts on incorporating or ask them, sorry, ask your thoughts on incorporating the agents, the agents of the ancients into scenarios. Agents of the ancients. I am, I'm not familiar enough with it. Uh, I thought it was actually best agents of the Imperium, which is like, Oh my God, if anybody read that Mark Miller book, uh, but uh, no, I had no thoughts. I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with it. Fair enough. Then I'll go to the next one then. Uh, same thing for set then. Um, have you have you played or any thoughts on the naval and mercenary campaigns? I know the mercenary is just coming off a successful Kickstarter for Mongoose. I don't know if you've had it yet. Um, no, no, I haven't. I haven't looked into to that one. Um, no, the the big ones that interested me because when, when we went through all of them, the the ones that that I gravitated to uh, was the Rift. Fucking love the Rift. Uh, so there, our most recent uh, traveler campaign that we just wrapped up was was uh, okay. So there's islands in the rift. It's like a thirty page adventure. Yeah, we played that for eleven months, um, and many of the adventures I've done, including Death Station, were all woven into uh, this tapestry uh, throughout the island subsector of the rift. Uh, those are the big ones that draw to me. Uh, I also picked up the uh, Deep Night Revelation because that that one really on, you know, calls to me. But uh, as far as the others now, I haven't, I haven't checked them out. Okay, right on. All right, next one's coming for Matt. Um, in the Third Imperium, there are a few mentions of the Ancients, but nothing substantial. Are there going to be any Agents of the Ancients added to the Core Sector Adventures? Uh, specifically, no, but we... In that big list of ideas uh, I mentioned earlier, um, and this is 
a bit closer to becoming a reality than some of the others. We've been talking about uh, a series of books that's um, uh, base basically their space archaeology, um, how to do it, the characters that do it, their equipment, their ships, et cetera, et cetera. But as part of that, we are looking at a, a ruins of the ancients uh, book where people can actually, travellers can actually um, poke around and get themselves into, into trouble. Um, beyond that, we've been talking for years about doing a follow-up to Secrets of the Ancients, um, which kind of brings the uh, the whole concepts of the ancients into present-day traveller. I mean, you've got the agents um, of them there. Um, we did think that Secrets of the Ancients could be um, part of a trilogy, um, possibly with a, a completely revised Twilight's Peak as a prologue and then something to end it, or maybe Secrets is part one and we do parts two and three. Um, so, yeah, that is on the cards. I think I know who wants to write it, so it's just a question of getting all, all the ducks in a row on that. Okay, great. Now, everybody, I'm still going through Discord, so keep typing in your questions in Discord and on Twitch. Um, I, I want It's not really a question, but I'm going to spin into a question. But for, for Seth and Matt, um, you guys received a, a heartfelt thank you from uh, Elliot for, for being part of this. Uh, and, and recommend you guys read it when you get a chance. Um, but I'm going to kind of spin this into a question a little bit. So thanks, Elliot. Um, for a lot of us uh, coming coming in on lockdown, uh, it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, there, was, there were probably times for most of us where we, we were isolated in our house. And a lot of us here at the Fantasy Grounds Academy and, you know, this community, the Fantasy Grounds community, we had somewhere to turn to to continue tabletop role playing and make those human connections while we were, you know, in the comforts of our own homes. Um, did, did you guys turn anything? It, we didn't, we haven't asked your guys to use of fantasy grounds and, and that's all right. Any, any type of virtual tabletop or anything that got you through lockdowns uh, during this to COVID? Well, at a mongoose, we had, um, I mean, here in the, U in the UK where everyone's on, everyone was on lockdown, but the, uh, the idea was introduced that you could have um, support bubbles, which basically meant that um, uh, family members uh, in different households could still meet each other and um, uh, not uh, fall, fall foul of the regulations. The benefit we have at Mongoose is that um, everyone else's family lives uh, a long way away um, and they couldn't. They weren't allowed to travel to visit them. So we formed our own mongoose support bubble um, in the, I think it was the second second lockdown. Um, we didn't get a desperate amount of uh, gaming done, but we uh, we, did, we managed to um, carry on the torch in um, a couple of our campaigns during that time. That's cool. Uh, well, I, I, th I think like most gamers, we, we had to learn uh online gaming and and whatnot so uh we primarily used roll 20 and discord because their audio sucks on uh, roll 20 and uh or and then the gambit of just different you know uh, zoom teams and, and different platforms like that uh so we uh i guess we ran about about a year and a half before um we ever saw each other again you know we ended one game I was like, hey, everybody, see you next, you know, month. And then a year and a half later, uh, we were finally in the room together again. So we we tried different things. I will say the big thing that I got from uh, that was the number of other games that I ended up joining because since everyone was getting used to doing it virtually, all of a sudden I was getting to play with a, with a lot of people from around the world that never would have been possible without that. And but because we we're becoming much more used to it, uh, we were much more comfortable like running it and inviting somebody that you always want to play with. So uh, that is is one of the little, little silver linings to the whole thing was uh, just the, the number of people that I have gotten to play with now. 
Yeah, that's cool. That that's definitely a thing here. Um, we get a lot of that from the community that comes in. They want to play. They uh, definitely have that going on. There's people that had to retrain themselves just to to learn Discord and all the little technology challenges. But uh, yeah, I, I concur with that. Great. And, and Elliot, sorry, I, I didn't see you in Discord when I asked. Did you want to um, go hot and, and, and thank him? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll just, uh, I, again, I don't have a question, a specific question, but essentially to, to summarize what I said was I just thank everybody for their dedication to Traveler um, as a game that I... Um, one of the, actually the first role playing game that I played uh, when I was uh, but a, a, a young teen in the early '80s, and so it's nice to see so much content and fantasy grounds and mongoose and and it, and it was like awesome to see Seth kind of get into Traveler and kind of I think bring it to a wider a wider audience. So again, thanks. I, I just appreciate that. That's appreciated. It's um, that, that's the reason reason we do it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Elliot. I'm going to move on uh, back to Nicole in the order we're getting them. Uh, with a the ancients only being three hundred thousand years in the past. Oh, sorry, Nicole. I'll let you ask. I forgot your mic. You got your mic working. Go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, really, the question was um, with the. Ancients only going back about 300,000 years. Is there any thought of looking into further back in the past um, um, civilizations that lived even before the ancients? Yes, is the quick answer to that. Um, Mr. Miller's done, um, started drawing uh, ideas together for that. It's not something we've touched in the moment. Um, and we've got no direct plans right now to uh to follow up on that but if when we choose to do so um the the groundwork has already been done by mr miller great good it's like the ancients ancients like you could just call it ancient <laughs> squared <laughs> <laughs> or cubed <laughs> <laughs> oh wow um any th other questions there on greg we, I go back to Russ, but we do have Mad Beer Man here with us, so yeah, uh, he did uh, give him an opportunity. He did he did kind of bring up a point on the uh, character wizard and okay. Colin, if I put you on the spot, sorry, but um, we, we got you uh, for Seth. Mad Beard Man is the uh, the handle of our real set community travel uh, traveler developer. Little Colin, you did you want to talk to anything about the wizard or anything in general? Uh, not really, because I've got a sore throat. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, Seth. Hello, Matt. Hello, everybody. Else. <laughs> Hello. Hello yeah, I was wondering where he was. Now it makes sense. So I know that uh, he's going to eventually convert the um, death station in a little bit more of an official capacity, but we have uh, people have already done it for themselves to run it in Fantasy Ground. So um, that's definitely going to be coming up in, in the future if you guys are interested in the module and you don't have the, the time to convert it yourself. So it, it's on its way. Um, and I appreciate you guys for putting that out for free because uh, free means a lot to a lot of people, right? Especially right now, there's a lot of people that don't have the income to buy anything. So uh, definitely a cool thing and a good good uh, gesture on behalf of uh, Mongoose, Seth, and everybody that's, else. Hey, that's absolutely Matt. Uh, it's, even when he pitched it to me, he, he, he originally pitched it to me, I, I think like last June or so. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a free thing that we want to do. So uh, that's, Matt gets full credit. Great. Okay. Uh, anything else there, Greg? No. Uh Nothing else has come in. I still got some some save rounds for Russ if we got time. Otherwise, it's yep. We got a, go. we got about a half an hour. Um, I think um, we will do a couple plugs at the end for just uh, uh, we got some uh, content in Fantasy Grounds that's on sale, and we'll put those links out. And then um, we have um, a sale on the actual licenses. So if you guys are 
out there in the uh, interwebs and you're not sure what Fantasy Grounds is, it's on sale right now for the Lunar um, New Year's holiday is what they're calling it. So there's sales for that. But okay, so what do you got right, for Russ? Back to, coming back from Russ, this was going to be for Seth. Okay. Um, with uh, your latest uh, YouTube episode of uh, Spacecraft Construction, um, do you have any more episodes in mind coming up for Traveler? Any any ideas? Uh, as far as how tos, uh, no. Uh, I I'm kind of done with that for now. Uh, unless something like really uh, strikes me, I just had I had had the spacecraft construction as something I wanted to do for a while, and then when I uh, saw the 2022 update, uh, it it basically answered one of the big questions like how do I approach this because it is so huge. Because uh, then we've got you know capital ships and and all the different types of uh, things that has well. 2022 was like, okay, this is really just paying attention to the core book stuff. So uh, that made that one a lot easier. I have several more scenario reviews I want to do, including the uh, the islands and the rift one. Uh, but I actually need to do some more of the adventures that we did during our, our run of that campaign before uh, I want to do islands in the rift, because that way I can say, it's like, and here is where we did uh, chariots of fire, and here is where we did this. and and kind of kind of run through all those so i do have a couple more of those i need to do but i'm just kind of taking my time with them uh otherwise if i if i dump like all of them back to back then yeah and then we're done so i'm spreading them out cool okay next one the the two more left for seth from russ and that's all russ's so i'll just kind of get through it uh and then see what else if this gets anybody else creative juices going so uh, Seth, what is what are your thoughts on the spread of the esoteric order of Deegan throughout the Traveler universe? Well, you know, it's really safer never to to talk about the esoteric order. Uh, people tend to go missing if you talk about it too much. So I'll just say, no, no comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And then last question for you, Seth, uh, from Russ, is have you incorporated psionics in your Traveler games at all? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, our, having a Scion really does change a lot, especially with that, that, that life detection. So I loved having a Scion, but dang it, I hated when they could um, you know, get some of the reveals before I wanted them to. So such as when we did Death Station, our Scion did a, a scan for life uh, and knocked it out of the park on that one. So I basically had to describe the mines that she felt in there as there was one that was, you know, human. And then the rest were these different types of, of, of animalistic. And it's because they were going through the, the cycles of, of madness at the time. And they were only kind of registering as human minds during you know, where they were in the phase. Uh, so I enjoy Sonics and Traveler. I love the fact that it, since you've only got so many Sonic points, um, a lot of people are like, oh, it'll break the game. It's like, no, well, because it, they can only do so much and then, and then it's over. And it gets harder as they go because they're based off of the, the uh, how much side that they have. So even if they have points left, now they've got you know, DM minus one or DM minus two, depending on how low their size is getting. So we're going to love them. It's cool. All right. Yeah. That was the last of Russ's. So and I'm going to flip back down to the bottom of our symposium chat, see if anything came through. Okay. Uh, um, let's see. Anything else? Nope, no direct questions. Uh, nothing coming through Laroon on uh, Twitch right now? Nope, nothing. I don't see anything. Yep. Um, so just uh, just wanted to say I uh, appreciate you guys doing this with us. Um, it's, it's not easy to coordinate these things, and I realize that you guys are – you know, constantly being bombarded with with different tasks. Um, it's nice to be able to sit back and talk to everyone and bring you guys together. Now, that was the the main premise of this. It wasn't so much to promote this or that. It was more or less to uh, to get you guys together and uh, let's talk about some gaming stuff. And uh, you know, that's the real the real takeaway from here. And also, I wanted to inspire 
um, people that are getting into the hobby, especially in regards to traveler, is that you know if you're creating content. What's what's that like from day to day? You know those sort of things. So that's what the uh, the first questions were were more geared towards. Um, and, and I'm really hoping that uh, after this type of show or these types of events that uh, we get some more people out there that want to create content and uh, participate in the community and and really become what they want. You know, it's kind of like your dream job. You know, you, you, you do your nine to five, but then you have this little gaming thing going and then pretty soon that gaming thing gets bigger. And then pretty soon you can say, hey, I can quit my job and or at least most of it and, and do this for a living. So. That's kind of what my hopes are. Best of luck with that. It's, uh, there's, there's really nothing better. Yeah, uh, that, being a professional dork is... is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, anybody else got any questions that uh, you want to throw out there? Um, or, or, or thank yous or, you know... Anything like that that you, that you know about? Okay. All right. So if um, I, I'm good, I don't have any other questions other than where would you start um, with uh, with Traveler? So if you were new to everything or just about everything, uh, well, where would you suggest to start at? Uh, well, I mean, either of you can answer that. Honestly, I think a good place to start would be um, Adventure uh, Seth did for us, Death Station. It's uh, a complete adventure, free to download on drive through right now. And it'll give you a good sense on how the game plays. Um, other than that, the current core rulebook really does provide everything needed to uh, kick a campaign off. Um, I think the one bit of advice I'd give is when you get a group together for the first time to try Traveller out. We always recommend simply going through Traveller creation as a group activity. Uh, we find that's normally enough to hook players and get them ready, uh, get them excited for the first adventure. Great. How about you, Sal? Yeah, if, if you're starting off, the, the the only book that you you need is the, is the core book. Uh, everything after that's because you want. Uh, but the, it is it is nicely contained in one book. Um, as far as scenarios or, or any of that, um, Death Station, because it's free, uh, I'm also a big fan of uh, High and Dry, and I'm a big fan of Flatlined. I think the two of those are spectacular kind of campaign openers, uh, and they're they're very contained in a, in a, in a, in a smaller area, uh, especially death station. Um, and then flatlined, uh, high and dry, a little bit bigger scope, but it's still, uh, contained. So that way you don't have to be a GM that feels like you, you have to know the whole universe or know this massive level of, of rules. And you can kind of get to get sample it without feeling that you have to have the whole rule set memorized already. So they're, they're just great introductories uh, to kind of figure out what it is you like and, you know, kind of get everything in order as far as what you want to do next or where you want to take it. Right on. Uh, would you guys uh, ever consider trying fantasy grounds as a player, maybe without having to, to do anything, but uh, just sit there and play for a few hours? I have, yeah. I'm, I'm, Great. Yeah. Always, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to have you guys uh, play with a couple of our our faculty members, just you know, just kind of see what it's about. Maybe pause and talk about different things, and, and maybe it'll inspire you to create something. I, I don't know, but uh, I'm really hoping that um, virtual tabletop will will keep growing and it will inspire you guys to create more content. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just for VTT, but I think through different mediums of play, uh, you're 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 gonna look at different things differently because of how it works. And maybe um, it's going to inspire both of you or even people that are, that are just going to get started to uh, to keep uh, creating content and um, kind of experimenting and, and researching and, and getting the, the uh, inspiration that you need for 
for uh, creating content because it it's another way of of consuming content for sure. Yeah, we give us a shout. Um, I'll see if I can get um, uh, the other people at Mongoose involved as well. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. healthy. Well, I'm so one of the big things I'm a, a massive uh, proponent for is 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 definitely diversify um, all the time. Whether it was you know whether you're, you're writing fiction or just writing a game for you and your friends, uh, always diversify because once you say this is the only way it can be done and this is the only way i'm going to look at it you will start stagnating uh, mm-hmm. there's hundreds of incredibly creative people out there that have brought incredibly cool things that you would have never thought of in 100 years uh try them out sample them uh you if, if nothing else it gives you uh kind of a well of, of inspiration that you can you know, makes gets the creative juices flowing that's great. Good advice to both of you. Um, so I think we're getting close to wrapping this up. Uh, Greg, do you have any questions um, directly for these guys? No, I, I think I'm good. Russ and I were kind of on the same wavelength. Okay, right on. Um, how? Uh, just to let you guys know, um, I don't know how the growth has been for Traveler on, on your end it, it's, it, at Mongoose, but... Uh, I know that in the community, when we first started doing these, this is our second year of doing a rule set focus, that uh, it's definitely picked up a little, uh, the traction. We have a traveler channel now, whereas before it was probably relegated to just an other rule set. So I think um, in in terms of, of usage and popularity, I don't have those numbers. I'm not a, a SmiteWorks employee, but I'm pretty sure that um, it's it's grown a little bit and that's that's a good thing because it it just makes it that much better for for everyone um that way you know you guys can continue to afford to to keep going and also uh to uh give people more inspiration to to contribute in it in it even um even if it's just inspiring someone to go out and get the core rule book i mean that's that's a big step that's a especially with fantasy grounds because not only do you have to have the the platform or the the book you gotta kind of have the the license for the platform so those things are on sale by the way uh, just ironically they are on sale i don't know if it was planned on smiteworks smart or not but uh they definitely have put that out there for for the community i know it's a lunar sale it just happens to be coincidental the, of the show but uh it, it's lunar, pretty cool space. yeah yeah, and, and to piggyback as the, the the lead instructor on the traveler group that we've done for the last two years, this is this is for everybody and maybe an assurance to Matt. Uh, just because January is ending and traveler month is coming to a close, doesn't mean we're not teaching traveler for the next eleven months. So stay active in the Fantasy Grounds Academy's Discord traveler channel. Uh, you know, and Russ and I are happy to give classes uh, by request as needed. Right. Got a couple comments coming in. Um, One on Twitch. uh, Bryce loves gaming. Uh, He said he's been wanting to try Traveler, and he's definitely going to probably check it out. And from uh, YouTube, David Burton, uh, one of our subscribers there, said that he's been running a long D&D 5e uh, campaign on Fantasy Grounds. He's kind of getting burnt out, and he's looking for another option. Uh, Mr. Skorkowski and the Fantasy Grounds Academy uh, Traveler videos have inspired uh, him for his next game. So uh, I think doing these Q and A's and, and keeping uh, engaged with the community really helps with that. And, and, you know, we do, we do some how to videos. We have some longer ones, but a lot of them we try to keep short. So the attention span isn't broken. Uh, so that, that's important. Me, I like, just did a 45 minute video. on <laughs> yes, <just> creation. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I looked uh, at that process. The game, by the way. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah that sounds fun david um and and bryce so i hope you guys get have fun and and you enjoy it and and start uh looking into it i i, I will say that um over the the past few years since i, I dropped my very first uh traveler video or, or content on it uh the the amount of traffic that it generates uh every time or is uh, steadily 
done on older videos has been increasing over that time. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that 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 is a market that you know more and more people are being introduced to, which I think is wonderful. Uh, uh, when Matt introduced me to Traveler, I, it, it blew my mind how uh, prevalent it was in in the community. But at the same time, I I knew nothing about it. I was just unaware of it. Um, and all of a sudden, so many references and everything started really clicking with me. And I'm I'm real happy that more people have been kind of discovering uh, this game. It's been around for for a long time. It's got an active active community that is just kind of thrilled to suddenly see so many other people in the room with them. So it's it's great. And the bigger it gets, the more cool stuff it comes out. Uh, so I love it. Yeah, this is this is really cool, guys. I mean, this is what it's all about. Um, getting getting this out there is is is, is important. And I, I looked at your process there, Seth, on your 500 slide plus, and I'm like, man, I, that takes a lot of dedication and time. I've done my own slideshows, and just 20 was good enough for me. So I yeah. I, I know your pain there. <laughs> Well, it's 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 part of the uh, you, know, you you try to at least be as thorough as possible, and um, that's uh, it, it's that's kind of my thing. Is I at least want it to be thorough and as clear as possible. And I'll still make nine million mistakes, and you know, I'll be called out on them till the end of time. But uh, let's try to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> So that's great. You guys are uh, certainly really good guests. I'm, I'm appreciating you guys coming in. Is there anybody else that wants to talk to these two or or to one of us? Because um, I think we can wrap this up. We've been going almost two hours, and uh, I think we're good. I think we're we're getting to the the wire here. If, if there isn't one, I got one from the forums actually. Okay. So this, this has been uh, up in the Fantasy Grounds Traveler forums for a couple of days. That got a lot of action. This one, so this is for Matt. Um, and then the question really isn't because we're not sure how how it happens. Uh, other rule sets get bundles on the Fantasy Grounds store, so you get, uh, for instance, maybe uh, the core book, High Guard, and the Traveler Companion bundled together at a slight discount. Do you have any control over that, or is that a SmiteWorks business decision? Um, I, I think it, I've, not, I've got no idea. <laughs> uh, we, we wouldn't be against the idea. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, something that's getting more and more traction and popularity with the rule sets. Because before it was just being D&D stuff, and now it's Pathfinder and, and uh, some of the classic rule sets. So it's getting to be more of a thing, I believe, in you know in marketing. And I don't know if you guys have any say or control in that, but uh, definitely a, a, an eye-getter. I think uh, for myself, if I was able to pick up all three of those in, in one shot, I might do it. So can I, I can just say something quickly there. Um, I, we have raised this with SmiteWorks. Um, and basically they said at the time there wasn't enough value in it for them. Okay. Because, of course, um, you know, everybody takes a reduction in their uh, slice of the pie, and unless it's selling well enough, um, I don't think they wanted to go down that route, but now that we've got um, four of the five core rule books, it, it makes complete and utter sense. So I will raise that with Doug again. Okay. Okay, maybe in a month or so we can get some numbers and see where we're at and see how how it goes. Now, um, one one thing I was I was wondering. This is actually just part of my kind of curiosity when it comes to the, the different stuff that Fantasy Grounds has. Uh, is there a deck plan designer anywhere out there? Because uh, I've I've done quite a bit of them in Photoshop, but is there like an easy one for somebody that doesn't have as much time and access to Photoshop to just build ship decks when we're doing uh, modifications. Like I want to put a uh, move this hall and put a med bay in. That's to anyone, even, even, even Matt. I can tell you um, in the office, um, I think it's uh, illustrator we use rather than Photoshop. Um, we have in the past looked at, um, oh, what's it? Cosmic Cartographer by Pelgrane. 
Um, that might be something to um, uh, to look at. It's um, very reasonably priced, um, as well as deck plans. You'll be able to do um, planets and sectors and things. Um, maybe look in that kind of area. Yeah, I think um, Fantasy Grounds could support something similar. I don't know how themed or how you know straight on it could be, but maybe if there was an asset pack that, that would be released with one of your... Um, content we can use tiles and and build those uh you basically have a template and you just swap the rooms out is that kind of what you're you're thinking in terms of uh building that's the... what i was thinking because you got like the outline like you got your, your free trader okay well the outline of the free trader is known uh, and all that and we can just try to shuffle tiles in there and you know kind of like we need this percentage that's fuel and stuff and then you kind of move stuff around i think I think that would be great, but I don't code. So I'm sure somebody that's coding is going, you know, like, oh my God, you realize how complicated that is? And you just. Because <laughs> right now you can take assets and move them around. So uh, just having the template and maybe selling it as a, I mean, I'm thinking in ter business terms, uh, but just having it distributed as a, as a map pack, but it has assets built into it. And one thing about Fantasy Grounds is it will protect your assets. So. If you save it um, in Fantasy Grounds and it's an actual Fantasy Grounds asset, you, you're you pretty much kind of confined to Fantasy Grounds. Uh, you won't be able to print it or you know anything like that, but you could arrange and build these and, and put them as a map. So it'd be just like having tile sets. Uh, but then, of course, you'd have the outline too so that you can you know, use that as your base. And just place there things is, as you go. There is kind of something like that at the moment, that the geomorphs. I don't know if anybody's messed with those at all, seen them or messed with them. Okay. No. <laughs> I, I don't. Um, are they on fantasy grounds or are they just geomorphs? No, no, no. It 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 was a um, um, I can't remember who put it out. Robert, somebody. And I'm I'm drawing a blank on the name. Like a, a year or two ago, and they're essentially just sections of ships in in grid form, and there's oh I don't know how many hundreds. I, th I think there's like four or five hundred. And and I've put them into a module for Fantasy Grounds and use them in my Traveler campaign. So if I need a cargo hold, I can just click a button and it comes up as an cool. asset to do whatever I want with. But there's images for everything you can possibly think of for a ship. That's cool. I think Ferroy, the developer, the guy that's doing the uh, Fantasy Grounds Forge content, I think he has something... It's probably a complete ship, but I I think um, if we work with him or, you know, and, and in between all the other parties, it might be something that, uh, you know, that that could be done. I don't I don't see why why it couldn't be done. It just I think it's just a matter of doing it, you know, and having the assets ready. I don't know who you'd get to build the assets, but if they needed to be themed for Traveler or themed for, you know, one of the rule sets or one of the... Uh, the books, like one of your core books, I think that would be a another avenue for um for what you call it for uh, revenue. Um, Robert Pierce was the guy you were thinking of, right? Uh, yep. Nicole. Yep, that's the one. Yep. Yeah, they're great, great little product, and they're free. He's just giving them away. Huh. So maybe cool. Robert would like to to make some of those. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, if somebody wants to contact them, like I said, I've already converted them into a module for for my game, and in the modules available up on my Facebook site. But um, you know, I, I think they're pretty good for for quick, easy things to use. So the short answer is yes, Seth. Okay, I think it can be done. Yeah, I believe there were a few map pack things, but. I don't remember what all they were named. I think some of them had Pathfinder in the name. I don't quite remember off the top of my head. I saw them on Steam store, but I hadn't really taken much of a look at them. Huh? But it was tiles for Matt. So. And, uh, Seth, this is uh, Mars Whip. He's a big fan. He's also one of our moderators for our um community he's been with us since the beginning he's probably one of my first fantasy grounds players uh, he taught me everything i know so uh this is a uh, we call him mars whip it's marshall uh he's one of our faculty members hello marshall <laughs> <Mars Whip. laughs> yep <laughs> 
Anybody else got anything? So that's good for content, by the way. That thinking about you know asset packs. I don't know, uh, uh, Matt, if you have anything like that on any of the other virtual tabletop stores uh, for art assets. Uh, to be honest, when at the moment we're not on any of the other tabletop uh, the the VTT platforms. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I don't know if you release them on drive through um, as separate content we've done some things um for the um as program um uh, we could probably stand to uh increase the number of downloads we got there I'll, I'll have to take a look at that okay there we go so just a little conversation there maybe something will come out of it you never know i just i think that that sort of things would just be real easy for you know, GMs to be able to use and incorporate. So, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, so anything else, folks? We're, we're uh, the hourglass is is getting low on the top. I don't see anything else on uh, Twitch or on the uh, interwebs. No, yeah, I think we're clear. And thanks, Bryce, for subbing to our channel. All right, so I think I will let you guys go. I mean, I don't have anything else unless you guys want to talk to each other. Um, I'm going to end the stream. Uh, anybody that's watching, this will be up on YouTube later. Uh, Seth and um, Matt, I'll definitely send you a message or you, you'll find the, our this archive of this video if you want. But uh, I don't plan on editing it. Um, I just think that I like the organic uh, conversation that we had. I don't think anyone said anything crazy, so I think I'll just let it rip. It is a little long, but you know what 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 is long for one person isn't is too short for another. So I, I don't plan on editing or anything. So what do you guys think? You want to call it a wrap? Greg, are you you good? Unless anyone's got any other questions. Okay, so I'm going to end the stream. You guys are welcome to hang out and, and talk if you want. Um, I'm going to end the uh, live broadcast part, and hopefully you guys will uh, uh, come back again.